Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Wilhelm. I'm executive director of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU. And it is uh, really a pleasure for us to convene the second year in a row, uh, a round table of innocence advocates in the US and Asia uh, at a time when it's very hard for us to travel between countries. Uh, we're excited to be able to provide a forum for lawyers and scholars and advocates to talk about the work they're doing, correcting, redressing, and preventing wrongful convictions. I, my role now is just to briefly explain today's program. We have two hours uh, after some brief remarks from our founding director of the US Asia Law Institute, Jerry Cohen. Uh, we're going to ask each of the nine panelists to very briefly introduce themselves. Uh, they're not going to give any details about the work of their organizations because we want to maximize time for discussion about the work. So we have provided a brochure that includes all the names of the panelists and detailed information about their organizations, particularly uh, what they've uh, achieved in the last year. So if you don't have that brochure, we are providing the PDF in the chat panel um, and you should see it. And after uh, Jerry's remarks, then a senior research scholar, uh, Ira Belkin, will moderate the discussion. And the format is that Ira is going to ask the panelists a series of questions. And as they respond, what we want to do is to encourage the other panelists and also audience members to raise follow-up questions or comments. So we get a little interactive conversation around each of the questions, which basically serve as a kind of a prompt. Um, and there'll be four questions. So we have about 10 to 15 minutes for each of these large questions that we're raising. Uh, panelists who want to jump in uh, out of, after their comments, if they wanna jump in with a further comment, they should uh, raise their hand. And if audience members want to raise a question or a comment, please post it in the Q&A panel. And Ira will keep an eye on the Q&A panel and uh, try to weave your question into the mix. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand the mic to Jerry Cohen, who, as I mentioned, is founder and uh, director emeritus of the US Asia Law Institute and an active advocate of legal reform around the world. Jerry? Well, this is a very exciting evening. Uh, I've spent my life working in the field of comparative law. And to think that we can bring off a discussion like this on a East Asian American basis on such an important topic. It's exciting. Uh, I retired last year, and I must say I'm thrilled to see how Catherine Wilhelm and Ira Belkin and Chu Yin and Amy Gao and other colleagues have continued and expanded using the necessity of Zoom to really reach out in a way that our in-law school programs could never do. So this is a terrific thing. I'm very concerned, of course, about wrongful convictions in the United States. Every day I read about them in the paper. And I'm working on the subject with respect to China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the comparative information we get from looking at the neighboring countries to greater China and Asia. It's very, very valuable and provides enormous perspective. So I'm really grateful to all the participants and I'm looking forward with huge anticipation to what you're gonna tell us. Thanks, Catherine and Ira. So um, if I could start, um, I'm just gonna, it's going to seem random to you because I'm just going to go in the order on my screen. So Simon, if you could start us off. Hi, um, good good afternoon for me. Um, my name is Simon Cole, and I am director of the National Registry of Exonerations. Great. Kana? Hi, my name is Kana Sasakura from Japan. Um, I, um, I'm a founder of the Innocence Project Japan and also um, Shaken Baby Syndrome Review Project in Japan. Great to see you. Uh, Tina Yu from China. Hello, everyone. My name is Tina. Um, you can call me uh, Yu Tianmiao. It's my Chinese name. Uh, 
I'm from Shangchen Law Office, and we run a project called NSS Project. Thank you. Great. Dr. Nam from Thailand, welcome to join us. Hi, I'm Dr. Nam Pan Bun Salang. You can call me Nam. I'm the founder of Indocent uh, International Thailand. Right now, I also work as a provincial chief public prosecutor. Great. Um, Meredith, great to see you. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you uh, this evening for me, afternoon and morning, um, depending on where you are. My name is Meredith Kennedy, and I am the director of the Innocence Network. Great. Uh, Nathaniel, welcome. Hey, good evening, everyone. Nathaniel Erb here. I'm with the Innocence Project in New York, and I sit on our government affairs team. And uh, Yunqing. Do you want to introduce yourself and your colleagues? Uh, yes, uh, my name is uh, Ke Yunqing from Taiwan Innocence Project. I'm the campaign director, and here is our executive director. Hello, everyone. Yes, thank uh, you. Lo Shixiang, and this is our new hired uh, researcher, Yu Ting. Uh, Yu Ting. Good um, morning and good evening. OK, thank you. Great. Um, uh, Lada Trisak, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Welcome, also from Thailand. Hi. Yes, you got that correct. Uh, my name is Lada, and I'm a lawyer practicing in Thailand. I, and I also uh, work as a lawyer for Thai, uh, Innocent International Thailand. Great. Welcome. For, for, with Dr. Nam. Yeah. Wonderful to have you. Uh, Thank you. Wang Wanxiu, Wang Lishi, I see you're calling in by phone. So the first question, uh, which I think is front of mind for everybody is, to what extent has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your work and how have you coped with the challenge of working um, during, this, during the pandemic? Um, I think I'm gonna start uh, Nathaniel with you, if that's okay. Um, and maybe you could also explain your role in the Innocence Project and generally how the Innocence Project's been coping uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I cut my teeth in international politics and comparative law, and that's where I came to came from when I joined the Innocence Project a year ago. So it's it's fantastic to be back in the in the realm of things with you this evening. Um, so absolutely, I mean, I'm sure as many people uh, have experienced it, it's been a complete whirlwind and change to a business as usual with the pandemic. Um, I sit on the government affairs team in uh, the Innocence Project in New York, and we I'm what's often called a lobbyist, and quite literally standing in lobbies and on sidewalks right. and in various rooms trying to catch lawmakers and uh, various uh, public servants to convince them on how to change laws that deal with wrongful convictions, both getting people back into court, uh, getting people exonerated, uh, dealing with the resource needs they have once they leave uh, uh, prison uh, is our main focus. And so once the pandemic hit, our team went entirely remote and it is a complete change to how we do business. We're no longer able to uh, stalk hallways and find people and catch folks. So some folks called it the dubbed it the battle of Rolodexes, which is who has whose cell phone number, who has whose email, who can you call, how can you uh, get in touch with the right person at the right time. Um, so in many ways, it's been a really challenging learning experience. I think we've also seen uh, a challenge to the way of doing things. A lot of legislatures in the US are very archaic in the systems they use, especially with the lack of technology. And we've really seen kind of the excuses thrown out the window to a certain degree of what they could have adopted sooner. So in some ways in the US, it's been a lot more opening of uh, the government processes of the public, the ability to zoom into public hearings, uh, a lot more things being online. But then there are a lot of governments because of the politicization of the uh, pandemic where that we're still business as usual operating uh, in person, no limitations whatsoever. Um, it's been really challenging for our team figuring out how to work in that environment, especially in an environment where if you're gonna be wearing a mask and taking various safety precautions, that it's that in of itself is a political act in the US. And so you're gonna be limiting the effect you have on conservative members of uh, the government governments. 
and how you can really sway their opinion when you can't walk into a room uh, with various necessary PPE. Um, I think it's really challenged us to think about how we can work with our legislative partners to turn them into champions. I think a lot of lawmakers will say in the US that they've somewhat enjoyed the more closed off nature of the legislative process where it's them talking to their colleagues in person rather than a bunch of hallways full of lobbyists and public interest groups and various others that are hounding them every minute. Um, so it's been an interesting process in that where we have worked to really educate lawmakers, really turn them into champions and parroting our remarks and really becoming experts that has, I think, led to a lot of interesting uh, uh, changes to our dynamics. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting as we go into the next year where we go into more hybrid systems uh, of how people are going to operate in public. And I'm sure it's something that everyone has, everyone's dealing with in many different ways. But uh, I think it's I think it's really an opportunity to open doors and how uh, we are utilizing technologies that are available to us and how we are diversifying our uh, reach to folks. Our digital team has really expanded their work. Uh, they were already at top much before, but increasing engagement with the public and our grassroots engagement has really uh, taken another role in being able to mobilize groups of people through the internet. Everyone's stuck at home uh, looking for something to do, and we can really give somebody an action to do by connecting them directly to their lawmakers, to their policymakers in their local jurisdictions. And we've definitely grown that uh, over the last year as kind of one of the few tools we still have in our toolbox. Um, so we'd be exciting to see how things change over the next year. Um, but again, we're entering a period where a lot of the work that our team takes on is kind of the low hanging fruit as it were is gone away. And it's all the difficult, really political, really challenging issues we have left. Uh, and when you have an environment where, as I said, there's the politicization of just basic personal health care, uh, that makes it rather difficult. Um, so, but I'm sure that is a, a common theme across the globe. Hey, great. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, and thank you for sticking to the time. Um, uh, Yunqing, how are things in Taiwan? I, Taiwan has had a uh, more success controlling the pandemic than many other countries. Um, so we're envious. Uh, but how has it affected your, the work, your work and the work of your colleagues? Um, I assume you also visit clients in prison and go to court. Oh, I see. I feel a PowerPoint coming on. Yes. Um... Uh, I, uh, I have prepared uh, several slides for each question, but just for uh, clearly understanding what I'm, I am talking about. So yes, uh, thank you, um, Ira, that the, the comparing to the situation in the rest of the world, I think the impact of the pandemic to Taiwan uh, can relate to relatively late and mild, but that doesn't mean uh, that our work was not affected at all. The most serious period of the pandemic in Taiwan, especially in Taipei, where our office locates, was uh, in May to July this year. So during the, this two uh, period, this two months, we were not able to visit our clients in the prisons since we were forbidden to travel across cities, and it was not um, very common for the prisons in Taiwan uh, for now to use remote communications devices for this matter. Uh, court hearings and lobby meetings were also postponed while the focus of the legislature uh, has shifted from um, slightly from judicial reform to the pandemic. All of our public events were canceled and uh, switched, switched to um, being virtual uh, events. Uh, although the situation in Taiwan was uh, controlled very soon in late July this year, but the government still remains certain restrictions, especially for hosting big events. Um, so we were forced to cancel our annual conference that usually take place in August. We also had some, of course, like everybody else in the world that have some difficulties for switching um, to remote work. One of the most challenging um, we had was the challenging, but one of the most challenged we had was the most of our case files, especially the documents from the courts, uh, were not ele uh, electronic. So we were hence to um, forced to cancel several case reviewing meetings because our students and volunteers were not able to uh, access to these documents. But I think comparing to our counterparts in uh, all around the world, these kind of difficulties might sound um, a little bit 
mild, mm -hmm. but uh, that's the that's the how the pandemic has affected our work in the uh, this two months or in this year. Thank you. Oh, great, thanks. Um, if we can just move on to Japan and Kana, um, we know. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you, Ara. So, so for Innocence Project Japan, it was a very challenging, um, especially in the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020. So many of us were actually planning to um, join the Innocence Pro uh, Network conference um, in March 2020. And it was the first time we were to join the conference as a big group, um, but it was very disappointing when uh, we found out that the flights going in and out of the country were all canceled. And eventually the um, conference itself was canceled. And so we had to also um, cancel all our meetings, internal and external. And we discussed about our cases during these meetings. Um, so when they were canceled, the process of case review has stopped as well. And since many of our board members, including myself, um, teach at universities and had to adjust to online um, web um, classes, everything had to stall in the first half of the um, 2020. Uh, we have a group of um, very dedicated student volunteers, but they could not become active either. I mean, they were you know, confined to their homes and um, they had so many um, online um, classes and uh, homeworks. So since the students um, had to, no chance to come to campus, um, it was also difficult to have new students joining the group, but it has been um, gradually changing here. So uh, many things have uh, started to settle in around late 2020. So we started to hold our monthly regional meetings in person and um, larger meetings online. And since we got, all got used to online meetings, uh, which was a good side, uh, we were able to hold a seminar online in October this year. So it was a seminar on how to defend drug cases. And we had a very, very good um, turnout of people. I think it was about a hundred, more than a hundred people came to join. So it was just because we held it online that many people were to, uh, able to join. And um, there are also some positive news. Um, several younger attorneys um, have joined us as volunteers in the last two years, and they are very dedicated to doing the screening and defense work. So um, the screening process has uh, speeded up, especially this year. And we also have several cases we are reviewing and might file for retrials. Also, um, Taiwan Innocence Project and um, IPJ are um, planning to hold an online event on 18th March, um, 2020 to 2022. <laughs> so next year, right? So I could conclude by saying that things are starting to go back to normal again for now, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Great. Um, and great to see you, Kana. Let's uh, maybe go to China and uh, uh, UTML. How are things? Um, we read a lot about how China is still very strict uh, with COVID um, and has very strict protocols. How, how has it affected your work? Yes, Ara. Um, thanks to China's mainland strict pandemic prevention and control measures, the pandemic situation has generally stabilized in China mainland, with occasional outbreaks occurring in a few cities which can be effectively controlled in a relatively short time. So I'm going to share some ideas about the pandemic impacts on criminal cases. First, most detention centers and jails require lawyers to wear masks and bring proof of negative nucleic acid test for COVID-19 to meet clients. During the occasional outbreaks, some detention centers may require lawyers with protection suits to meet clients. Some detention centers may close at once. So we need to keep our eye on the notices of the detention center and the pandemic dynamic. Second, the detention center policies are not just for lawyers. The policies are also the same with prosecutors and judicial officers. During the outbreaks and tense period, the detention center may not be able to bring the accused to court. Um, thus, some cases are suspended for several months or a longer period. Um, this may lead to a long period of detention in some cases. Likewise, some cases in second trial profiles are now required to be heard in court, and there are certain obstacles during the pandemic period. So many cases in the second trial progress are more likely not to be heard in court. Um, there is clearly a longer wait for progress in post-conviction cases. Um, 
Therefore, the court has also explored a solution. For some small cases, online court, uh, online court hearing can be held. For lawyers, if the case is not going to be heard in court, they have to say, state the reasons for holding court, write a more detailed written opinion, and better communicate with the judge face to face. The case is uh, suspended for a relatively long time compared with the possible penalty that's supposed to apply for bail. But the possibility of getting bail during trial is not likely. This is a pro program. This, this is a problem. Third, it is inconvenient for lawyers to handle cases on business trips. Um, most of the time, it's okay to go business trips. If they travel to or from a city which currently have COVID-19 cases, they may need a negative nucleic acid test within 48 hours to pass through. However, if the pandemic suddenly appears right in the area when they run across, they may be quarantined in a local hotel or be required to stay at home for 14 days. Generally speaking, the pandemic has had a certain impact on judicial trials and lawyers' work, but the overall impact is not so significant and can be handled. That's all. Well, thank you very much. You, you painted a very clear picture um, of what's happening in China. Um, Simon, I want to turn to you next, and I'm um, I'm interested in hearing about your work. And uh, I hope it won't be unfair of me to also ask you. Um, there were many, many exonerations uh, in the U.S. in the past year, and if you have any insight into how uh, lawyers are managing handling these cases um, and how courts are managing them during the pandemic, it would be great if you could share that as well. I know that's not the main thing that you do, but um, uh, I, we want to hear about your work, but also if you have any insights into that, I'd appreciate hearing about it. Okay, sure. Um, thanks, Ira. Um, in some sense, the National Registry of Exonerations has a staff of seven people. And in some sense, we were lucky in that we were already a virtual organization before the pandemic. We were located in four different states in the United States, and we had been having staff meetings on Zoom for a couple of years before the pandemic started. So we already knew how to use Zoom and were familiar with it. Um, and so in that sense, uh, that, that helped the transition for us. Um, however, of course, you know, there's costs to being a virtual organization and we're more aware of them now as, as well as of the advantages. Um, one of them is that although we usually met over Zoom, we also had one or two in-person meetings a year, and we have not been able to have those since the pandemic. Um, and that um, has been difficult for us. Um, and the other is it's just, you know, you lose something when you're a virtual organization. And in the case of my university, it's having a kind of physical presence on campus, a, a place where an office where students can go and, and see the registry at, at work and, and so on. And so, that's kind of a cost. Um, so with regard to your question, Ira, I guess um, we were, we were um, many of you may know, you know, the courts have greatly slowed down um, their processing of cases uh, during the pandemic. Um, trials are not being held and are still increasingly rare. Um, so I guess we at the registry are surprised, we're somewhat surprised to see that the flow of exonerations is more or less the same as it has been in previous years. And so I think, I think our best guess is that um, on the one hand, the, the courts have slowed down so that would it, we would expect to see fewer exonerations because they're just not processing things. Uh, on the other hand, um, lawyers are able to file motions um, on humanitarian grounds and making arguments about safety and, and health um, and that they have a person who's alleging innocence and they're in prison and prison is a you know, is a very dangerous place um, for health reasons. And, um, and so, and, and in some sense that might be more persuasive for the courts. So the, 
those two things seem to have be maybe balancing each other out to some extent. And um, the the number of exonerations this year will probably be pretty consistent with with other years. Yeah, thank you. So um, we need to move on to the next question. But if anybody had something that they on this topic that they felt they needed to say that hasn't been said, you could just raise your hand and let me know. Dr. Nam, how 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 are things in Thailand? I would like to put this this question to uh, Ms. Lada because as a practitioner, she she facing this every day of working. So let let her present. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you, and Dr. Nam. Uh, so what affected uh, most? Uh, what 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 affected us uh, the most is all caught uh, at the beginning and, and uh, during every wave uh, of the pandemic in Thailand is all court cases were postponed uh, and, and without new date. And so, so we were just waiting without knowing when it's going to be the next court date for, for us. So, so it, it was bad. And, and especially when our clients, uh, they, were, uh, they were not uh, released. Uh, so, so they were just uh, locked up in jail not knowing when it's going to be their, their, their day in court. So, so well, that, that was bad because, uh, you know, they, they were just waiting in jail. And um, uh, worse than that is no visitation was allowed during that time. So, uh, so we as a lawyer, we could not uh, talk to our clients so that we, we could not have, uh, we could not uh, do any case preparation, preparation with them and, and uh, when, all the local office, uh, they, they, they claim that they still operate, but basically we could not contact anyone. We could not call anyone. So no one answering the call. So, so, uh, so we, we, there, there's no way for us to work on a case and, and to prepare for the case. So that was really, um, um, the worst that could happen to a lawyer that is going to have, um, trial, um, in, and who knows when? Yeah. So and is that, that, that's is that it. still <laughs> is that still the situation today, or has it gotten any better? Um, for uh, it's it's a little bit better because at the beginning, uh, we didn't have all the online system in place, but now they're getting uh, the, the court is is getting better, doing better for uh, in terms of that. So, uh, for, for for some hearing, they they already allow it to be online and all parties uh, appear remotely, but 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 still for for trials and and uh, for jail uh, for a person visitation, it's still um it it's still it's still difficult for us to um to every time every time we need to see if uh it's going to be allowed this time or not, but it's not like for sure just just like before the pandemic. Um, it sounds like a lot of, no matter what jurisdiction you, you're in, the pandemic has had a huge impact um, on people's work. Can I just pop in <laughs> real, yeah. real quick? Um, so again, I'm Meredith from the Innocence Network. I, and I, I interrupted Ira because I really probably have the most to say to you all, to all of you in response to this question. And I will say much, much less in response to the other um, questions that I was gonna pose. Um, but, but I did wanna share some information with all of you because we have spent a lot of time over the last almost two years now working with the organizations that are part of the Innocence Network, several of whom are, are represented on the panel and the audience um, with us tonight to help understand and, and mitigate in some cases the negative impacts that the pandemic has had on our work. And we've, we've um, done quite a bit of research in partnership with the organizations in the network about the impact that COVID has had. And I just wanted to spend two minutes recapping uh, some of that data with you because I do think it's quite interesting and, and actually is responsive to a question that Catherine put in the chat around um, you know, how, how much jurisdictions have really done to um, you know, to, to release folks on humanitarian grounds. It's actually, at least for network organizations, not as much as you might think. Um, so, so again, you all probably saw in the pamphlet that the Innocence Network is a coalition of 68 independent organizations. 56 of those are in the U.S. 
12 are outside of the US. So we are primarily a domestic network, but the figures I'm gonna share with you represent uh, everyone. And I will you know, very much try to be inclusive in the, the data that I'm sharing. Um, most of the organizations in the network do non-DNA cases. So they have historically spent a lot of time investigating cases, um, you know, really sort of boots on the ground, interviewing witnesses in person, going out and seeing if evidence can be located. And because of the pandemic, we had uh, 26 of our 68 organizations report that those investigations were dramatically impeded. You know, much more difficult to develop a rapport, for example, with a witness that you are interviewing via Zoom or via the, the telephone versus being in person. So that was a very significant impact that folks reported. Uh, definitely client access and communication with clients that are currently in prison was another huge place where organizations that are part of the, the network reported a negative impact. We had 18 organizations point to that as being a very, very significant challenge uh, for them in the last year and a half. Court delays, which is something that Simon mentioned, that is also something that a lot of folks pointed to. Um, you know, courts and court proceedings were really drastically slowed down in almost every jurisdiction in which our organizations work. Um, on the bright side, several organizations reported that the pandemic forced them to digitize their records. And that might have been something that they had planned to do or that they had as a goal, and they were really pushed to get that goal over the finish line because of the pandemic. Um, and a lot of our organizations are nonprofits or NGOs. They have to raise their own budgets every year. And very few folks reported that the pandemic had a negative impact on their fundraising, which was a really good thing. We also talked with organizations in the network about what impact the pandemic has had on clients, their current clients that are in prison. Um, and, and I was quite surprised by the responses that we received to that question. So almost half of the organizations in the network, so 30 organizations in the network, um, reported that the jurisdiction in which they work didn't make any changes to prisons as a result of the pandemic, which is you know, somewhat terrifying, right? And made them very, very um, concerned and worried for their clients' health. So uh, 19, Organizations reported that the jurisdiction that they work in took action to reduce the prison population through things like early release, commutation, parole, clemency, um, things like that. So, you know, it's not nothing. It's 19 organizations that reported that. But again, that's out of a, a coalition of 68 organizations, so a smaller number than I might uh, imagine. Um, and some of the respondents that were part of that, that group of 19 said that those actions weren't even very robust. There were just a handful of folks who were released through those, um, those processes. Very few prisons in the jurisdictions in which we work implemented mask mandates or movement restrictions. We only had six organizations say that prisons in their, their jurisdictions took those steps. Um, only six restricted uh, visitations. Um, let's see, I'm just looking down to make sure I'm getting these numbers right. Only eight made an effort to, to speed vaccinations to um, currently incarcerated folks. Uh, only eight instituted uh, testing or quarantine protocols. So again, very bleak picture when you look at prisons in the United States, um, you know, that house in some cases thousands of people, um, you know, quite shocking actually that there, there collectively has really been so little done to, um, to really mitigate the effects of COVID on folks who are in prison. Yeah, Meredith, thank you for flagging me down and that was kind of the information I was hoping to get, but I didn't realize you were the one who, who had it. Um, does anybody have any questions or want to add anything? Um, you know, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, in the United States, we've heard a lot of reports about COVID outbreaks in prisons and detention centers. Um, I don't know if other jurisdictions have had a similar experience. Um, 
Meredith, is your is that the information you just um, uh, communicated is that published anywhere, or is that still um, just something that you're tracking yourself? We we published it in a summary report that we created and shared with um, with our members of the Innocence Network and with some other key stakeholders. If folks are interested in a copy of that summary, I'm happy to share it. Great, thank you. All right. Um, it is the moderator's challenge to try to balance moving things along as well as giving everybody a chance to speak. And uh, it, you know, again, if if I'm uh, if you have something that you think is pertinent and I haven't called on you, or you think of something after I have called on you, please try to flag me down either with the electronic uh, hand raise or just a wave. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the next topic. Um, it's of course very common um, in uh, wrongful conviction cases that one of the causes of a wrongful con conviction is government um, misconduct and including prosecutorial misconduct uh, one of the issues we want to talk about um, we want to talk about the role of prosecutors in creating wrongful convictions and then my next question after we go give everyone a chance to speak will be um, the role of prosecutors in uh, assisting in exonerations. But first, let's talk about government misconduct and what your organization has encountered um, you know, in the past year. And um, Simon, I'm going to start with you since you have a big overview um, perspective on the US. Yeah. Um, in the US, uh, according to our numbers so far, the uh, exonerations in 2021, that 68 percent of them, so uh, more than two thirds of them, involve some kind of government misconduct, um, including prosecutorial misconduct. Um, so that's um, that's very high. Um, of course, government misconduct is always high. It's always a leading cause or the leading cause contributor to wrongful convictions. Um, but the, the historical figure is more like 55%. So, so it's even higher. Um, I think that that's probably because of the um, cases out of Chicago. Um, the, a, um, a, a big case involving a group of police officers who were planting drugs on people and extorting drugs and money from them. Um, uh, which is now up to 87 uh, exonerated defendants, um, all from this group of police officers in, in Chicago. And there's about 15 of them in the 130 or so exonerations in 2021. So I, I think that's probably the, um, the reason for that. And that's, um, that's not prosecutorial misconduct, that's police misconduct. But um, so it continues to be a um, very common contributor to wrongful convictions in the United States. Okay. Um, Simon, do you, can you break uh, down the, the forms of misconduct a little bit, or is that, um, uh, I don't know if you have that available, or should we come back to you? Yeah, not, not right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I want to turn uh, again to Dr. Nam from, from Thailand. Um, and again, how big a problem is government misconduct, especially prosecutorial misconduct in Thailand? And uh, I know you yourself are a prosecutor. Um, okay, as a prosecutor, I would like to say that uh, in our process in, in Thailand, we have no, uh, we have nothing to do in the process of exoneration. Even we have uh, the law for retrial for those who uh, claim that they are innocent. But uh, according to the law, we not allow prosecutors to, to uh, initiate another trial. So the case that uh, they are prosecuted, so 90% of the case are, were prosecuted by prosecutors. So only few cases that prosecutor can uh, making pre to the court for the retrial. So for me, I, I would say that uh, there is a lot of problem in, in, in our system. 
uh, even in the hospital process, they uh, have the very passive, uh, very defensive attitude. So this, that in the court as well, they try to hide what they have uh, done uh, wrong. So uh, for for the people outside our our system, our office is uh, let Lada Miss Lada to to present her her experience. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Dr. Nam. So uh, just just as Dr. Nam said that uh, uh, well, well, my my answer to to the question is uh, what what concern us most is the police misconduct because we, we've had um, problems with police misconduct and, and it surely contribute to uh, wrongful conviction because uh, in terms of uh, credibility, uh, whatever they did uh, um, to the case and whatever the information they, 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 um, they, they add into, into their um, um, report or present it to the judge eventually, uh, the judge will likely to believe them more than our witness, uh, such as their, uh, well, uh, the, the, uh, um, the the problems that that you can encounter would be like um, forced confession and um, physical abuse uh, during the uh, during the um, uh, well their investigation and um, you know and, and it leads to like false um, um, fa false confession and and uh, and uh, misapplied uh, forensic um, science and and. Uh, and, and, and yes, and, and, the, and, and it surely contributes. And okay, so uh, because all these information in Thailand um, by design is, uh, the system by design is um, um, uh, gathered by police and um, just maybe one or two before the deadline that the case needs to be filed to the court, uh, the, case was, uh, the case file was hand to the prosecutor and so the prosecutor didn't have enough time to review the case again. And in Thailand, the, the prosecutor didn't, just, just as um, uh, Dr. Nam Tha has already um, um, uh, 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 told, told you that uh, the prosecutor didn't have um, um, role, much roles uh, during the investigation. So um, maybe one or two before the deadline, uh, the police handed over the case file to the prosecutor and the prosecutor didn't uh, have any other choice uh, except for filing the case first because it was almost almost this deadline. Uh, and so when the case was, was filed to, to the court, and uh, during the trial, just like I said uh, at the beginning, uh, in terms of credibility, the judge would likely uh, believe what uh, the, the information presented by the prosecutor then, uh, then our witness. So yes, that, that would be our most um, concern and, and problems that, uh, that contributed to wrongful conviction. Okay, thank you. Um, if we have time, I would love to hear more about the problems with police interrogation in Thailand and uh, your... For sure, we, we just had uh, this big news um, about the, the um, physical abuse during the interrogation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as we found out over the years doing these programs, um, doesn't matter so much what country you're in. Uh, doesn't matter so much what the legal system is or the political system. A lot of the problems are very common. Um, uh, if we could go to Taiwan, I know um, the Taiwan Innocence Project has also focused on uh, misconduct of government officials in your work. Wenqing? So as some of the panelists might have already knew that we have um, 10 exonerations uh, so far since the number has been sort of stuck here for almost one year and one and a half year. But among the 10 exonerations we have, six have been the victim of the of misconduct, which is 60% of our cases. Um, although the sample size here we have here is quite small, uh, so the percentage might fluctuate very much if we have more exoneration. 60% is still a very horrifying figure. Um, we have no time to dig into all the six cases today, but I have um, identified several types of official misconduct here, and there 
there are three cases in this slide and three more in the next slide. I will stay here for a bit for you to um, see the details. Um, just, just adding one information that the six cases listed here were all exonerated between 2017 to, 2000 and to 2020. But the crime reported of this um, cases ranged from the earliest 1986 to the latest um, 2010. To, um, so the forms and the types of official misconduct can be quite different from case to case. However, there are two common types uh, I would like to share today. And the first one is the failure to properly collect, handle, and preserve evidence. Um, this is kind of one of the biggest problem we can see in these cases. If combining the problem of, conceal, um, of concealing exculpatory evidence, it appears to be the most common type of official misconduct we encountered. Um, for example, in uh, Zhen Xingzhe's case, the police moved the guns up in the crime scene before taking any pictures and totally destroying the whole investigation. Um, and in the in the Xie Zhihong's case in here, um, the police, this is a, another case with death penalty. Um, and Xie Zhihong's first written statement that clearly denying committing any crimes, that statement was hidden by the police. And then um, Xie Zhihong was then coerced by the police to confess and his confessions become, uh, became very vital in his conviction. Here we can also see that obtaining uh, false confessions uh, is another big problem. And it occurred in half of the six cases here, including the case of Zhen Xing that I've mentioned in the last slide, and Su Binghun here, and Xie Zhihong. Uh, there were all, uh, these were all very serious crimes. Zhen Xing and Xie Zhihong were com uh, both convicted of murder and sentenced to death. And Su Bing Kun were, were sentenced to 15 years for robbery and attempted murder. Again, I like to uh, point out that we are limited by the relatively small sample size here, but there is no doubt that official misconduct is a very important contributor in uh, Taiwan um, cases. And that's all for me. Yeah, so I noticed in um, your presentation, you, you talked about uh, mishandling evidence and in your brochure. I think you said the Taiwan Innocence Project is working on a bill on chain of custody um, in the legislation. Do, do you want to talk about that a little bit more? The legislative change to improve chain of custody procedures? Yes, the, the, we, we have a, um, a plan to um, establish the evidence preservation regulations in Taiwan. And I, I have um, made a slide in the, for the, for um, questions, so I can share it later, or should I? Yeah, that's okay. Let's do that later. I think in the um, last session, it's going to be, um, yeah, we're going to invite everyone to talk about most recent developments. And I see from everybody's write up that uh, during this period of time, legislative reform was a big active area um, for for most of you. Um, so we we'll, we'll hold that for the final question. Um, uh, Kana, any um, developments or anything you want to talk about in Japan regarding um, official misconduct as a cause of uh, wrongful convictions? Sure, Ira. Um, I will focus on the prosecutorial misconduct and um, give you an overview of uh, the situation in Japan. So the problem with the Japanese um, criminal justice system, especially with the prosecutors, is that um, they never admit to making mistakes. And so they never um, learn from errors. So um, Professor David Johnson uh, at, at Hawaii University, who is actually with us today, um, is an expert on this subject. And um, he has named this phenomenon, the cultural of, sorry, culture of um, denial. So um, David, if you wanna add anything, um, please let, let us know from the, um, the, the chat, please. So this overview um, attitude or culture um, of the prosecutors, I think um, is a main obstacle, sorry about that, um, main obstacle to exonerating um, the wrongfully convicted and ultimately is the one of the major causes of wrongful convictions in this country. Um, the criminal justice system in Japan is dominated by prosecutors. And um, uh, so the 99.8% conviction rate 
shows that the prosecutors themselves serve as judges um, and thoroughly um, screen the cases. But however, um, this, when this screening is done and a case is indicted, um, the prosecutors use every power to get the cases convicted. So for example, in um, 2010, um, an unprecedented scandal came to um, light when Atsuko Muraki uh, was acquitted of the violation of the personal law. So the evidence of her guilt was a confession um, of a co-worker who was also indicted as a co-conspirator and inculpated uh, Muraki. The court found his confession unreliable and acquitted Muraki, but what was remarkable in this case was that um, a prosecutor of the special investigation team of the Osaka District Public Prosecutor's Office, uh, who was in charge of indicting this case, was later indicted and found guilty of tampering with evidence. So the case was hub highly publicized and urged the Ministry of Justice to set up a commission to review the Public Prosecutor's Office and ultimately um, reformed the law to bring in video recording of the interrogations, in some cases, actually. Um, Muraki case illustrates um, the extent to which the prosecutors use their power to get a conviction. And this was, the, this was actually 10 years ago. This case was actually 10 years ago. But recently, there was another case in Osaka where the special investigation team uh, forced some confession out of um, a person. And um, Mr. Nishi, who is with us today and is a member of the Innocence Project Japan, um, had worked this case and, acquit I mean, uh, and exonerated this case. And also in retrial cases, uh, the prosecutors are very, very reluctant to admitting their mistakes. So in Japan, um, to get a retrial, one must have a clear and new evidence, uh, which sheds a reasonable doubt to the conviction. However, all the evidence which were collected in the original investigation is in the hands of the prosecutors. So, um, and they are very reluctant to disclose these evidence. And even if there is uh, in important um, evidence or of innocence, um, I mean the Brady material. So furthermore, when the courts grants a retrial in one of the cases, the prosecutors will almost always appeal the decision, um, which will result in delayed justice. So one of the reform agendas now is reforming the retrial laws, including um, creating evidence disclosure rules in the retrial stage and prohibiting the appeal of the prosecutors to decision granting a retrial. Thanks. Thank you, Kana. So I'm curious, in Japan, is it a, a legal requirement that prosecutors disclose any exculpatory evidence? It is not a legal requirement. OK. That's... So we don't, we don't have the Brady rule. Wow. Um, all right. That's even with the Brady rule, we have many, many of those cases. So um, without it, I, I can only imagine how, how difficult that must be. All right, I wanted to go to Nathaniel from the Innocence Project. Um, and uh, um, how has your work been affected by um, official misconduct, either you personally or the Innocence Project in general? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is uh, unremarkable, but also still remarkable uh, hearing that a lot of the issues that we all experience across the globe are very similar. Um, it strikes me uh, like again, bringing back my experience in international affairs and a lot of international criminal work of the export of US jurisprudence across the globe over the so many decades has maybe affected a lot of that. And I think we at the US have a lot of responsibility for <laughs> a lot of these issues elsewhere. And I think strikes strikes me also is the pursuit of the confession, regardless of how coerced that confession may be. And I think, I think to our policy work and a lot of the work that we do really focuses on tacking the various aspects of an interrogation and how it produces false confessions uh, in many different areas and how we can protect the integrity of, of, it, of the interrogation. Um, obviously that relates directly to the involvement of law enforcement. And then when you get in the hands of prosecutors, we have a, a major issue within the inability to really hold prosecutors to account. Um, you have uh, within law enforcement in the US, we have the legal doctrine of qualified immunity, which is uh, a basically an absolute protection of law enforcement from uh, any type of legal action stemming from misconduct that occurs in criminal cases. But then when you expand it to prosecutors, you have what is true absolute immunity in the US and is the total inability of prosecutors. There. Uh, uh, inactions 
or and actions in criminal cases. Um, the courts back in the 1970s decided that uh, it was uh, a hindrance to uh, uh, criminal investigations to be able to, to have prosecutors held to account in any way. Um, we continually face across uh, many cases and uh, having prosecutors and law enforcement as the gatekeepers of uh, both uh, exonerations as well as political reform being a major obstacle to things we deal with here in the US. Um, so yeah. Thanks. Let's let's go to China. Um, and uh, lawyer Yu Tian Miao. Um, how does uh, official misconduct, either by police or prosecutors, um, how has that affected the work that you're doing? Is it uh, how is it a major cause of wrongful convictions in China? Thank you, Ara. Um, I I have noticed that Yun Tian's presentation. I think the answer here in China mainland is very similar as Taiwan. So we are a family. <laughs> uh, I don't know if uh, Wang Wanxiong have any uh, answers for this question further. 刚才听了这个咱们泰国包括台湾地区以及日本的这些代表的发言很受启发呃对于我们刚才提到说中国的司法体系当中那么检方的不当行为确实是造成冤串的一个重要原因之一当然刑事错案的成因很复杂呃在
关于检察机关的一个不当行为。当然，你说中国的检察机关呢，它还有一个职能就是法律监督职能，尤其是在呃错案的重审当中呢，检察机关发挥的作用还是比较大的。呃、你比如说，我们有一个呃这个申请再审的一个途径，就是向检察机关。呃，这个嗯，申申嗯，这个申诉复查处呢，提请嗯，要求他们来进行审查。他们发现有问题以后，也会向法院提出检察建议，要求纠正这个错案，或者说他们可以直接提起抗诉，那、呃、要求检察院法院重审此案。比如说，我曾经办理的海南城满杀人案，就是最高人民检察院直接向最高人民法院提起抗诉而得以纠正的。呃，当然在这个时候。啊、不好意思啊，王律师，下一个问题就是提到这个，呃，就是检察官在呃那个征求原罪错案的的这个呃作用，呃，这个嘛，你、哦那个、等会再说吧。好的，我的发言就到此，吴教授，谢谢。OK， thank you. So I just want to uh comment that it and and this seems to be a common issue among many jurisdictions in Asia where the police. And prosecutors really operate um, independently of each other. The police conduct the investigation, and then hand the case to the prosecutors, which puts pressure on the prosecutors to just accept the work that the police have done.、Um, that seems to be a common issue, as opposed to prosecutors and police working together, which doesn't solve every problem. But、um, uh, at least the prosecutors might be able to exercise more. Supervision over the investigative work of the police.、Um, I think、um, I'm trying to was trying to listen to、um, <laughs> the Chinese and look at the chat as well.、Uh, I think one of the other issues that、uh, Lawyer Wang mentioned was、um, the pressure that prosecutors and courts are under to process process cases quickly, and so judges, even in weak cases, possibly cases where defendants are innocent.、Um, They sentence them to time served to avoid、um, having to、uh, seek accountability for the prosecutors or the police to have made mistakes. So,、um, I just want to check and make sure that I gave everyone a chance to speak on this topic. I'm looking around my screen,、um, and、uh, I don't see anybody waving their hands. So, I'm going to move on to the next topic, which Lawyer Wang started to talk about. And、um, uh, I think this has been in the news in the United States recently. I see that it was mentioned in a couple of the summaries that you provided, and that's the role of prosecutors sometimes in trying to correct an injustice.、Um, uh, I think the conviction integrity units in the United States, especially recently in Detroit, Michigan, have gotten a lot of attention.、Um, uh, In terms of their work,、uh, exonerating the factually innocent, and so this seems to be a topic that a lot of people were interested in. Um, and um, I, I think I'm going to start、uh, with Taiwan, uh, uh, Yunqing, because I, I noticed that you mentioned in your summary、um, the introduction of conviction integrity units in Taiwan,、um, and I know in past discussions you've also talked a lot about how helpful. It Can be, or how difficult it can be sometimes to get the prosecutors on board. But if you do, how helpful it can be. So, can you talk talk a little bit about the role of prosecutors in Taiwan in exonerations?、Oh. Yes.、Uh, thank you.、Uh, do you see the slides? <laughs> yes. Yes. So the 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 answers to the two <laughs> questions are the same. Yes, they、uh, the prosecutors in Taiwan can be right, quite helpful、uh, in. Exonerating innocent persons in the post-conviction context, and yes, they have been helpful. But I think they could be more helpful than they are now, and、um, there's reason for that. But before、um, before that, I I will want to like to share、uh, with you、uh, three exonerations worth mentioning. And、uh, according to our code of criminal procedure, the public official shall give、uh, equal attention. To matters favorable and unfavorable to an accused. So, based on this principle, it is also the duty of the prosecutors to step in if they notice any wrongdoings, even in a post-conviction context. 
there have been three um, exonerations in Taiwan where prosecutors had played uh, positive roles. And the first one is Lu Jianming. Uh, in this case, it was a prosecutor who filed a motion for a post-conviction DNA test, and it was he who filed a motion for a retrial uh, based on the new result. Hence, uh, bring about his the, Lu Jianming's exoneration. And in the second case, uh, Zheng Xingzhe's case, the prosecutor um, procedurally filed a motion for a retrial on behalf of a death row inmate. And that is um, never seen in Taiwan's judicial history. That action has largely uh, accelerated the whole process of Zheng Xingzhe's exoneration. Uh, and the third case is Zheng Xingzhe, uh, no, Xie Zhihong. Uh, Xie Zhihong is another prosecutor uh, is another case that I have mentioned before earlier. And in this case, another prosecutor stepped in and he discovered the evidence hidden by the police for 19 years. Um, he filed a motion for a retrial on behalf of Xie Zhihong and Xie Zhihong was fully exonerated uh, in, two, in 2020. So although it has already been the prosecutor's job to right the wrong and to tackle on the issues of wrongful convictions and they have uh, been doing uh, some work of on, in this issue, but it, this task usually is not their top priority. In 2017, we successfully set up the Conviction Integrity Unit in Taiwan under the Prosecution Office. However, the CIU in Taiwan has not functioned very well as those in the US have. For the past four years, it has only taken two cases. One possible reason behind this might be the prosecutors in the CIU in Taiwan still have to deal with their normal ongoing cases. Um, we have been urging the prosecution office to make this a specialized unit, but the change has not yet come. So this, despite the uh, performance of CIUs in Taiwan is not very satisfying, the confrontation between the prosecution and the innocence organization has seemingly diffused in recent years. The cooperations between Taiwan Innocence Project and prosecutors have increased as well. For example, the, the attorney general of the prosecution was willing to come to our annual conference in 2018 uh, to have a opening speech. And one prosecutor has even joined our project this year to write a manual for post-conviction relief practice, which is about to, uh, which has been published two weeks ago. Um, so our cooperation uh, on specific cases has also increased. Just in this year, the attorney general filed a motion for extraordinary appeal for one of our clients whose innocence innocence had been proven via DNA testing. But the court dismissed the motion very quickly. And after this failure, the prosecution office decided to stop. So the actual cooperation um, between the prosecution and the innocence organization has started, but not yet firming, firmly um, established. So to sum up, I will say that the prosecutors in Taiwan have started to show their interest in innocence cases and they have accomplished uh, in some cases, but I think there is still more um, longer way for them to go from here. Thank you. Great, I see Kana, you have a question in the chat. Do you wanna um, ask it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so was the CIU in Taiwan um, set up by the legislation or? So I have to, have to clarify that it's not actually CIU no. in Taiwan, it's like a Taiwan version CIU. It's a so it's a committee oh, under yeah. the uh, under the prosecution office to review uh, uh, convictions. And that um, is not a law, it's, it's kind of a regulation inside of the prosecution office. Great, great, thank you. So I, um, I, I, well, I have a question and a comment. My comment is um, if, if uh, I know you have a lot of resources and a lot of relationships with um, folks around the world, but if we can help you connect with um, some of the more successful conviction integrity units in the United States, We'd be happy to do that. There is a there is a difference. Some offices are quite active and successful, and some are less so. Um, and I think the structure of the office, like you mentioned, whether the people are devoted full time to that work, 
Um, and often whether they've hired people with experience as defense lawyers to do that work uh, makes a big difference. So we can talk about that um, you know, offline if we can be helpful. Um, the question I had was, to what extent are the prosecutors in Taiwan actual gatekeepers for exoneration cases? So I think in some of the past presentations, um, I've heard from the Taiwan Innocence Project, um, one of the big obstacles is convincing the prosecutors to join you in asking for a retrial. Is that an absolutely necessary step in Taiwan uh, to getting an exoneration or is that just a, a helpful step? It, it will be a very helpful step if they decided to join, if we can convince them. But it's not a it's not necessary. We can file a motion for retrial only by on us on the defense side. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to turn back to uh, 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 Wang Wanqiong or uh, Tina um, to talk about China. Um, Wang Wanqiong. I know Wang Lishi, Kang Zai Ni, Ni Jin Kai Shi, Hui Da Jiga Wenti, Jushi, uh, Jian Chai Yuan, Zai, um, Zhen Jiu, Yuan Jia Chuan, and the Zuo Yong, uh, Kang Zai Ni, Ni Jin Kai Shi Tan, and Kai Chi Shi, Kim Wong Jia Shama. How the, how the, but, eh, how the, the more Kang Zai Ti Dao Jiga, Jian Chai Guan, the Yiga Fali Jian Du Zuo Yong, Wei Zu Yi Dao, Kang Zai Yu, Taiwan Di Chi, Hoja, Zam Mei Guo, the Jesse, 检, 这些发言人, 嘉宾提到说, 呃, 检察官的作用呢, 它是比较不正式的, 特别在台湾, 呃, 在中国呢, 实际上法律监督这一块, 嗯, 提出这个申诉这是我们说到检察院在法律监督当中提起了抗诉，然后呢，予以纠正平反的，啊，基本上是这样的，不叫做没有别的问题。I think as in every jurisdiction, when the prosecutors can recognize that a mistake has been made and are willing to act on that, it of course can be very helpful in um, making an exoneration happen and expediting it. Um, and I want to turn to you, Simon. Um, does the um, registry track um, cases where uh, prosecutors have played up a uh, constructive role in uh, helping to obtain exonerations in the United States? Um, yes, we do. Uh, we primarily do that by tracking the role of um, uh, the involvement of conviction integrity units. Um, we also have another tracking that we don't show publicly about the prosecutor's role in the exoneration generally, whether they were helpful or resistant to the end. Um, so, um, and so this year, 38% uh, of the uh, exoneration so far had the involvement of a conviction integrity unit. That's slightly lower than last year, which was 47%, but um, pretty, pretty consistent. Um, as with the most recent years, there's an increasing number of cases in which they cooperate with innocence organizations that, um, in doing so. And the, the other thing we attract is the number of conviction integrity units in the United States, um, which is up to 91 now. 
um, it was uh, 33 in 2017. So, so it's tripled in four years um, and it was uh, 74 in 2020. So, so it's, it's gone up a lot. Um, the other thing we, we track and it's on our website is um, whether they have exonerations or not. Um, so of those 91, 41 of them have had one exoneration or more. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, Ira, some of them like Detroit and Brooklyn and Dallas are very active. Um, fit, so 50 of them have had no exonerations at all. And um, we can discuss, uh, there's a debate to be had about whether having exonerations is a good measure of the <laughs> Uh, quality of a conviction integrity unit. There's reasons that it might not be, but um, but th those are those are the numbers. Um, the the trend that you mentioned, Ira, about hiring defense lawyers certainly occurred a fair amount in the past year. We're seeing that increasingly hiring prominent defense lawyers and lawyers from innocence organizations in in conviction integrity units. Um, and just finally, uh, we at the registry uh, find we're interacting more with them. Some of them are contacting uh, us when they've created a new conviction integrity unit and want to talk to the to the National Registry of Exonerations about exonerations and what we know about them. Um, and at least, and some of them are beginning to contact us when they exonerate somebody and and let us know, um, which is. Uh, a change in the, the um, attitudes that were prevalent not too long ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering from your remarks, as well as from other things we're reading in the press in the United States, if we're seeing the beginning of a culture change. Um, I mean, I, you know, there was a time not very long ago, and I'm sure Meredith could speak to this as well, when the expectation was that prosecutors would fight, um, you know, to the end to keep a conviction, and that may still be true in some cases. But there also seem to be more and more prosecutors uh, willing to admit mistakes, and there is a trend in the United States. For those of you in Asia who may or may not know, many of our prosecutors are elected, and more and more prosecutors are running as so-called progressive prosecutors, not just uh, tough on crime prosecutors. Um, so I'm just curious, if maybe I could direct this to Simon and Meredith and Nathan, if you want to jump in, are you seeing, do you think the beginnings of a culture change among prosecutors offices and conviction integrity units, or is that too, too much to, uh, too much of a, um, overly optimistic point of view? Uh, I'll just briefly say, yes, I think something is happening and then um, we can hear from Nathaniel and, and Meredith. But I think I think I heard Barry Sheck this week give a statistic, uh, maybe my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, that 20% of the US population now lives uh, somewhere where there's a conviction, a conviction integrity unit. Um, so, so it, you know, it, it is an increasing trend. We're seeing more every, every year when we count them. So I'll, I'll let um, my colleagues comment. Mar Marith, do you wanna add anything? This is such an interesting conversation because it's really raising for me, the need for us in the Innocence Network to do more tracking around collaborations with CIUs and with prosecutors. I mean, I think, Simon, it's fascinating to hear that we now have 91 CIUs in the United States. If you would have asked me to, you know, just ballpark how many, I would have said 50. I would not have said 91. I mean, there has just been like an explosion of these initiatives in prosecutors' office offices and, you know, and some have not done much and some it's probably too early to tell uh, what they're going to do because they are still so new um you know but i think at least within the innocence network we we think a lot about official misconduct 
uh, and the the negative role that prosecutors often have, you know, in wrongful conviction cases, and we we track that, um, you know, very specifically. We don't or have not yet tracked collaborations with CIUs, and certainly we have had many exonerations achieved by members of the Innocence Network in collaboration with conviction integrity units. Um, something that's actually coming up for us now in the Innocence Network is how to best communicate with CIUs. And, and what I mean by that is when you uh, are an individual in prison with an innocence claim and you reach out to an innocence organization to request assistance, you are typically then sent what we call a questionnaire, right? And you, you fill out that questionnaire and you include a lot of information about the circumstances of your case and your innocence claim. And part of that questionnaire is usually um, a, uh, you know, an opportunity for you to say who else you've reached out to in the innocence network or innocence organizations to request assistance. And you give permission for those organizations to talk. And the reason we do that is because we don't want organizations duplicating efforts. We have limited resources, right? Um, limited staff, and we, we wanna avoid a situation where you might have two innocence organizations in Texas who unbeknownst to each other have both been working on the same case for a year. However, we can't really do that with conviction integrity units because there are real conflicts of interest there. Um, and I, I don't wanna call out one of my colleagues that I know uh, was in the audience earlier, Justin Brooks from the California Innocence Project, but I was speaking to one of his colleagues from the California Innocence Project a couple of days ago. And she told me that there was just recently an exoneration achieved in Southern California by a conviction integrity unit there and when the California Innocence Project went and looked at their queue, that person had written to them and was, was in their queue. And obviously, you know, if they knew um, that the Conviction Integrity Unit was also taking a look at that case, they would have uh, fast-tracked it in some way. There, there could have been a collaboration. They just simply didn't know. So that's something that, again, we're really thinking a lot about in the network right now. How, how can we do a better job when when we aren't necessarily the organization that's taking the case to a CIU, right? When the CIU is really identifying the case on their own, what are ways that we can really learn about that and collaborate, um, you know, again, at the very least, so we're not duplicating efforts? And I'll, I'll turn it over to Nate now with, with his thoughts. Nate, did you want to add anything on this topic? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's something we think about a lot in the policy department and we're constantly in com uh, uh, conversation with lawmakers as well as directly with prosecutorial offices that are looking to establish something of a review process. Uh, and I think it's 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 obvious that CIUs in the U.S. have been an important tool of exoneration and even more so today than they ever had before. And there are really great prosecutors out there who are doing the hard work and changing culture in their jurisdiction. I wouldn't necessarily say I would tie it to a culture change across the US because I simply look at still the lagging adoption of the basic uh, rule 3.8 3 of, of the American Bar Association around the what is the ethical responsibility of prosecutors just to turn over exculpatory evidence and to seek, seek to remedy wrongful convictions that they know happened. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, but I think we in the policy department really look at CIU's kind of the balanced on a knife's edge of we see the uh, cultural perspective of exonerations in the U.S. and what is a real true exoneration uh, in the eyes of lawmakers and the eyes of prosecutors and the public. And there's still this huge wall we face of people really only seeing an exoneree being a true exoneree if the prosecutor agrees or pathways to compensation, pathways to uh, any uh, getting back in the court all through the eyes of the prosecutors and anytime we are working on a reform to various aspects of the legal process dealing with wrongful incarceration or just general legal reform in our department it's all needing the blessing of prosecutors or at least keeping them at bay uh, and unopposed as much as we can be um, so our always concern is 
while CIUs are incredibly important tools, uh, especially in areas that are uh, intransigent in terms of getting back into court, um, they can be a ineffectual panacea to the problems that we face in our roles. And if you have a CIU that is utterly ineffective, uh, it can really hamper efforts to create pathways for defense attorneys to get their clients back into courts because legislators will simply say, oh, well, there's a CIU, we don't need this, or there's this pathway here. And you, oh, well, they, the prosecutors didn't agree, or there's reasons this person must still be guilty, or they must not be deserving of compensation. They must not be uh, X, Y, and Z. And it's a, uh, it's a real problem that we face. Um, so I think it's, and, and I think it is something that we work on. And we also have worked on a couple different issues recently of uh, laws around the country dealing with prosecutors being able to uh, initiate motions to vacate convictions. Um, it's something that we've uh, just uh, explored in different places because it was the key tool to getting certain clients out in different jurisdictions across the US. Um, so it's something that we're continually working on and exploring, but I think our first priority is always to ensure that there are the legal remedies and tools in place for defense attorneys to represent their clients and to make sure that it is a, a true adversarial process first and not just everything with the blessing of prosecutors. Because I think that's the danger we see of the reliance on CIUs as the ineffectual panacea uh, and kind of the um, white whale that sometimes lawmakers will chase as the, the solve everything type of problem and just pin it on the prosecutors as their responsibility to take care of and we don't have a role in it here. Um, so I think it's important clearly has been hugely crucial across the country. There are amazing prosecutors out there uh, that we work with and talk to and that have championed a lot of the reforms we'll talk about at the end of the evening tonight. Um, but it's it's that nice standard that we walk on in our department. Well, I think Yun Ching maybe said it really well. They're helpful, but they could be more helpful. Um, so Dr. Nam, you are a prosecutor. I am a former prosecutor. Professor Cohen was a prosecutor early in his career. Um, and you said earlier, I think that prosecutors in Thailand don't have a big role to play in exonerations, but you uh, have taken the very unusual step as a prosecutor to start an innocence organization in Thailand. Could you talk a little bit about how you, why you decided to do that and um, kind of how you see your role as a prosecutor personally? According to my, my patient, I working as a prosecutor for over 22 years. So I have seen a lot of uh, innocence coming to our system. I try to help them personally by uh, put more investigation and order the police to do further uh, in investigation. But I still find that uh, a lot of cases that out of my hand that happened in everywhere in, in Thailand so that's why I, I try to learn what, what's going on in our system. I can conclude that our system is a problem, is a pro big problem, because I don't know if you can imagine in the system that all the things have done by police at the investigation process, they can destroy, they can hide, they can de destroy all evidence they want. And under our uh, dictator, di dictatorship government. So we cannot reform any law. Even I try to, to reform many, many law like reopen acts to allow prosecutor to reopen the case. In our, our system, prosecutor cannot reopen the case even they see that a uh, wrongful conviction happening. So because uh, the law said that uh, case that prosecutor can reopen that only the case that he not uh, prosecute that case. So as I said earlier, over 90, 95% that prosecute by, by prosecutor. So that, that why prosecutor have lit, little role to do in, in this, in this uh, kind of things. So I try to encourage. Then I, I found that no hope for this government in, 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 in past seven years. I try to encourage my colleague, my uh, office to do like, uh, we have to uh, do like a uh, progressive role, right? Once crime uh, happened, we, we need to see the crime scene to correct uh, the evidence by ourselves. But I still find the, the uh, different attitude from my colleague. 
most of uh, many of them are high, higher ranking than me so they they not listen to me but uh, i see the progress i see the progression because many prosecutors are realize that we cannot rely on what written in the file in the report handing handing in by police so we we try to uh, encourage our colleague i i correct my friend my my colleague over hundreds prosecutor we urge we encourage our attorney general to try to accept a progressive role and then after you can you imagine in in your in your country everything controlled by prosecutor but prosecutor have to do, to do their, their work with police right so they have check and balance right but in our system police do all the things at the at the beginning so we we dictatorship we are under dictatorship situation not only in term of political but in term of uh in term of uh criminal justice system as well well um i would really love to hear more about um your work and how your colleagues um feel about this as well but um because of our time constraints we're going to have to move on i saw um tina had her hand up before and wanted to make a comment so i just wanted to let her react to what somebody else just said and then we'll come back to you so tina thank yeah. you uh, okay thank you uh dr wong have already introduced what a prosecutor can do in a post-conviction case before uh, I totally agree with Dr. Wang. Maybe I can talk a little more to further explain his idea. I've noticed that many cases, uh, many uh, retrial progresses are promoted by prosecutors. Uh, and ha I have several post-conviction cases in hand. Some are noticed, noticed by judges. Some cases are noticed by prosecutors. Literally, according to the law, both judges or uh, and prosecutors should have the same standard to receive plea files. But in practice, the standard seems not so clear. Some cases are noticed by prosecutors, but the court wouldn't even receive files. So um, this case can also happen in another way, which means judges may receive files and notice the, uh, and they examine the case, but the prosecutors refuse to receive uh, files. So anyway, it was a try. There was a case that the prosecutor have already uh, visited uh, the convicted family to, uh, this is my case. Uh, the, the prosecutor in the case have already visited the convicted family to investigate the truth and heard my opinion. Uh, they are almost going to file a protest to the court but it's a pity that the prosecutor died of cancer suddenly. So the case is postponed. I mentioned this case to illustrate that prosecutors, what prosecutors can do in a post-conviction case. In other cases, the prosecutor uh, may re-examine the forensic evidence or trace evidence and so on. Uh, so uh, I hope that one day I can share this case detail to you if the case is going to have retrial program for site and result in a appraisal. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Kana, thank you for waiting patiently. Um, can you tell us about uh, the situation in Japan? Sure. Um, I'm so envious about all of you because um, <laughs> because um, in Japan, um, the prosecutors can be helpful, I wish, I mean, but uh, in fact, they are not. So um, the Article 4 of the Public Prosecutor's Office Act in Japan stipulates that uh, the pro prosecutors are representatives of the public interest, and also a document called the Principles of Prosecution, which was published by the Supreme Prosecutor's Office in 2011, after the Muraki case that I just described, uh, states that we shall strive to the utmost to discover the truth in each case with all of our knowledge and skill to ensure that no innocent parties are found guilty and all um, those responsible are brought to justice. And also the prosecutors can um, file a retrial on behalf of the, um, the former defending defendants, according to the Code of Criminal Procedure in Japan. 
But these are all written in the laws or um, official papers. However, prosecutors are in fact overly concerned with winning or losing and almost never um, re file a retrial on behalf of the, um, the defendants. So I think the Japanese um, prosecutors pr prosecution office lacks transparency and accountability. And also their resistance and reluctance to admitting their mistakes is very concerning. So I have in hand a journal um, called uh, Quarterly Criminal Defense. And um, in this issue of 2020, um, we have a special issue on prosecutors and wrongful convictions. So in it, developments in several countries are features, including the United States, the CIUs, and Taiwan and Korea. And um, David and I um, co-authored a um, article on the developments in the United States. So the developments in your countries are actually a beacon of hope because since we know that the prosecutors can admit and correct mistakes, but we have a far long way to go. All right, thank you very much. Um, I, I wanna thank everybody for your um, presentations and, and responses to the questions we had posed. Um, we're a little bit over the time. So the next uh, uh, section here, maybe we can do it simultaneously, which is, uh, I'm gonna ask each organization to just maybe pick one or two highlights from the last year um, that you wanna talk about. And we had initially scheduled three or four minutes, but maybe we could shorten that to two minutes. Uh, and that I wanna invite the audience members and all of the panelists as well to put questions in the chat um, now and we'll collect them and we'll try to get as many of them answered as possible um, before we close. So um, again, this is kind of a random order, but uh, I think I'll start Meredith uh, with you and, um, and, and Nathaniel, can you just highlight a couple of things? There's tons of great information in the brochure, the Innocence Project, as, as in every year, you've done a tremendous amount of work, but what are the one or two things you want to just make sure everybody knows about? Well, I will just take one minute to plug the fact that um, picking up on something Kana said at the, the very beginning of our meeting, the Innocence Network Conference will be back as an in-person event, we hope, in uh, 2022, April 7th, 8th, and 9th. We're going to be meeting in Phoenix, Arizona at a hotel called the Arizona Grand. And, um, you know, this is coming on the heels of not being able to hold the conference for two years, not being able to gather together to see one another, to share information and share strategy and, you know, and most importantly, to um, provide all of the folks who have been freed or exonerated by the collective efforts of people in our community um, to come together. And, and for those who have not been able to attend an Innocence Network conference in the past, it is a truly unique and singular event, uh, very, very special. Um, no other event like it that I'm aware of that brings together so many different kinds of folks who are working to advocate for those who have been wrongfully convicted, redress the causes of wrongful convictions, and of course those who have been um, victims themselves of the system and have emerged triumphant as, uh, as exonerated. Um, so please join us. If you are able, and again, we are very, very cautiously optimistic this is actually going to happen. We are planning as if it will, uh, and we are going to open registration on Tuesday. So check our website, innocencenetwork.org, for more information. Well, I really hope that the meeting does happen and that everybody uh, can attend. It is an amazing event, um, unlike any other kind of conference. And I know people who work in this area and we've heard it from uh, several people that in your own country, you may feel somewhat lonely um, doing this work. Maybe you don't have as many colleagues um, as you would like. And so the chance to come together and meet people from other jurisdictions who are doing similar work, who are facing similar challenges can really be um, 
uh, fortifying. Um, so yeah, Meredith, thank you for sharing that. Um, again, let me go to um, uh, uh, Yunqing. Do, I know you said you were uh, saving some things for the end. Uh, yes, so uh, be, be, because of the time limit, I will um, skip off some of the developments. But for in this part, we like to focus on the progress of our legal reform. And the first one is uh, uh, DNA, the Post-Conviction DNA Testing Act. So since this act came to effect in 2016, it has been five years past. Um, however, only 18 cases requested a DNA test under this act, and only three of them have successfully conducted the test. We all know that it wouldn't be a guarantee for us to get a, pos a positive result in every test. So till now, none of those have been exonerated. The biggest problem of they here is the, the lack of evidence pr preservation regulations in Taiwan, as I have mentioned like many times before, um, especially in the post-conviction context. Most of the requests um, for a new DNA test were denied by the court because of the samples have been destroyed. And that's also the reason why we're um, really working very hard on the draft of the evidence preservation regulations. Uh, and this is the one I am going to skip. So, um, because we have the, we have had the draft in, sent into the legislature. So, and um, I would like to share the two reform plans in the coming year. Um, for the code of the criminal procedure, the judicial yuan has provided their comments in 2000, uh, about the revision in 2019. And after two years of deliberating and lobbying, now the draft has entered the legislature, le legislature again. In this uh, version, they have cooperated with the Dauber standard from the United States uh, for the forensic evidence entering courtrooms. This is, um, if um, come to effect, will bring fundamental changes in the criminal proceedings in our country. And hopefully it can help enhance the quality of the forensic science in our judiciary. Uh, at last, as mentioned many times, we are trying to establish the regulation of evidence preservation in Taiwan, and we will work in two directions. Um, first, we like to hold the public officers handling evidence accountable, because that is not really um, what it is. That like kind of uh, that kind of responsibility was not re clearly written in our uh, criminal in our code of criminal procedure and second direction by asking the officers to inform the interest parties before destroying the evidence uh, after conviction we like to strengthen the um, protection of the right of the convicted to secure the evidence so that they can maybe file a motion for a dna test afterwards after they were convicted of a, any crime uh, they they claim they didn't do. So we are still trying to developing the draft and working with the various um, experts and scholars and um, the different units in our government um, to find what structure and design of evidence preservation work best for the judiciary in our country. And that's all. Oh, oh yeah, 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 oh, yeah, sorry. There is an, one more that uh, in this year, um, in March in 2020, we have translated uh, Blind Injustice from Mark Gotti, uh, oh. our old friend, and old, maybe some of you know him. Um, and this book uh, is quite popular actually in Taiwan society. So this is kind of a new progress I would really want to share with you that I, we learn a lot from the network and this is a, like a very specific result and thank you. Well, thank you, Yunqing. We invited Mark to join us, but I think he had a conflict. Uh, but now that you've translated the book, maybe you will translate the opera as well. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, Kana, you, um, uh, I made you wait till the end last time, but maybe you could um, share with us one or two highlights from uh, your work in the past year. Sure, Ira, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna focus on the shaken baby, um, the progress that uh, we had with the shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma cases in Japan. So um, we launched a sister project of IPJ, um, SBS Review Project in Japan. 
um, which was which we launched in 2017. So we have been working for almost five years, and we have so far gotten eight um, finalized acquittals. Um, so in the past year, we have had three favorable de decisions. One Supreme Court decision affirming the high court's um, acquittal, and two high court decision affirming acquittal in district courts. So these cases, as well as other cases, have shown that there have been serious mistakes made by um, expert medical doctors um, in determining abuse in these cases. So eight acquittals in one category of cases is a lot in Japan with 99.8 um, conviction rate. However, again, um, in this situation, the prosecutors are not admitting their mistakes. So they are saying that um, publicly, actually, that these cases resulted in acquittals since the standard of proof is so high in criminal cases. <laughs> or the judge uh, did not allow the evidence which uh, the prosecutors wanted to present. So by reading these um, acquittal decisions, the, these allegations are completely false, but they nevertheless uh, say that um, it, it was not because of the, the person was innocent, but they failed. Um, I mean, the court did not understand the situation. So um, in light of these eight acquittals, I think there have been similar cases in the past um, before 2017, where the care caretakers were convicted of shaking their child and abusing them. Um, so there should be a systematic review of these uh, past cases as well. So our next move is that we are now trying to find some cases which we were convicted in the past and file retrials for them and get um, acquittals um, in them. And I am also editing uh, with uh, Keith Findley and Wayne Squire and others, an international book on um, shaken baby syndrome. And we have a section on international developments to which um, Taiwan Innocence Project and Chi from US Ali uh, has made contributions as uh, so I um, thank them uh, for their contributions. Thanks. Thank you, Kana, and congratulations on those um, uh, successes, really very impressive. Um, all right. Um, I, I saw Dr. Nam, you put something in the chat about your plans for the coming year. Uh, do you want to um, share that with everybody? Yes. Uh, I have heard that CIA uh, are about 91, right, in in, in US. Yeah. So, but I, I think this is very, very uh, helpful if prosecutors uh, turn their face to, to uh, try to achieve what they have done wrong and try to revise that. So, uh, but, you know, for me, I have uh, a lot of obstacle, obstruction. Even in my office, I have to fight with uh, all attitude, is defensive atti attitude of prosecutor. And in, in, the, in the lawmaking process, I am I also in the lawmaking process, uh, I also fire, fight with the dictatorship government, they're not allowed the, this kind of law. So even I, I win, I won in, in the like in, in the panel, but I always lost at the at the when when they go to the to the government. So uh, yeah. hopefully one one day I, I win. <laughs> well, I hope so too. Maybe next year when we come back, you will be reporting some victories. Um, okay, let me know. <laughs> So I want to turn to China. This is just uh, you know one or two highlights from the last year of your work. I want to say something about our work. Okay, so is that okay? Yeah, okay. of course. Okay. Um, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, our present cases is still waiting for the next step right now. So this year, Shenzhen Law Office and the China University of Political Science and Law jointly launched a one-year pro bono project aimed to provide legal aid to defendants in need of help during the procedure of uh, review of death penalty sentences. This is also a new try. We are hoping that we can have more wrongfully convicted defendants uh, in time and make sure make more contributions to the legislation of death penalty. And they are taking maybe four or five cases right now, and they are still working on this. Uh, I think more cases will be taken uh, in the uh, next few months. Uh, that's all. 
your your clients are very fortunate to have some of the most skilled lawyers in China working on their cases. So I wish you the best of luck. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Wang Wang Wanqiong, Wang Lu Xun, you want to add something? Uh, okay. Ten years of one of the most successful achievements. 呃，今年嗯非常惭愧，没有多少次突出的成就。哦、没关系。呃呃，国家在这个死刑的这个案件当中呢，我觉得比较突出的一个立法是关于非法证据的排除，以及呃对这个刚才田淼提到的死刑复核案件当中呢，加重了这个听取律师的辩护意见的这样的一个权重。那么我本人手上呢，目前有三个申诉案件，有一个是刚才提到的贵州鲤鱼前的案件，在本月的二十号左右会召开，嗯，这个再审以后发回重审，也就是说重新回到一审的一个庭前会议，这个案件会公开审理，就是二十年前的一个故意杀人案的重启，啊、呃，这个呢虽然前景不是那么乐观，但是呢我们还是。呃，非常希望能够最终让这个目前还关在监狱里面的这个李玉前呢，能够平反出狱。希望明年有好消息。谢谢教授。Thank you very much. Um, I only see one question in the chat. Um, and I see that we're at nine nine o'clock. Um, my time. Um, so, uh, are folks willing to stay just another minute? To, um. To answer this question, it's not directed to anyone in specifically, but it's some wrongful conviction cases happen. Um, I think because of a wrongful inference, um, uh, a legal inference, and uh, the question is whether um, uh, you have an interest in wrongful convictions based on pure inference and legal procedure problems. I guess as opposed to misconduct that we discussed earlier. Um, uh, so I guess the question is whether the Innocence Projects take on cases because of legal uh, defects as opposed to um, misconduct or mishandling of evidence. Um, so I think you know that's a big question that probably would take a lot of time to answer. Um, maybe we could um, uh, ask the questioner to sort of send that to us and see if we can get a response. Certainly, the websites of the National Registry and the Innocence Project, uh, I think, cover um, all of the basic um, causes for wrongful conviction. So I would invite you to look at those. Um, uh, sadly, our two hours have gone by very quickly. It's um, kind of it's great to see everybody. A little reminiscent of the times when we've been able to meet in person, and so it's a little bittersweet because it's. You know, not quite as satisfying to uh, have the time to hang out and chat, but um, it's really better than not being able to see you at all. Uh, I want to just thank all of you for not just taking the time to participate tonight and all the people who are calling in. Um, but really, it's just um, it's great to see all of you, and uh, we're such fans of all the work that you do. Um, and feel very privileged that we get to um, participate in these discussions. So thank you all very much. And uh, I hope you can all make it to Phoenix <laughs> in <laughs> April. Um, but I hope that we can continue having uh, uh, these kinds of meetings from time to time. So good night to those who are at night. Good day to those who are in the morning. Xu Xiang, wonderful to see you. Um, and um, everyone take care and stay healthy. Yeah. Yeah, here, here. Bye.